this is more than we expected and we don't have enough chairs but thank you for coming and uh, we look forward to having a, a good and engaging time together and we're really interested in the question and answer period so we're really looking forward to that we have an impressive lineup of speakers for you tonight so if you've heard the advertisement and you're here then you know what's happening um, and I'm just going to get right to it so without any further ado I'd like to introduce Mr. Teo Du let's give him a round of applause he's going to be our master of ceremonies for the evening one of our amazing voices of Bermuda, what I call one of what we call our bright, brilliant, beautiful Bermudians. Teo. All right. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, that's entirely too generous, and I am grateful all the same. Good evening, everyone. I am slightly overwhelmed uh, by the attendance uh, to this event. It is wonderful to know that so many of you are interested in learning more about uh, this incredible innovation that we are committing to, to hopefully take our country um, into a whole new level of activity um, on the technological and intellectual level. It matters and your presence is important. So thank you for being here. Now, show of hands. Uh, this is called Blockchain for Beginners. So let's see how many folks know what blockchain actually is. That's pretty good, actually, because I'll be honest, despite being a card-carrying certified geek, when I first heard Blockchain, I thought it was some kind of unique weapon in Minecraft. <laughs> you laugh, I'm grateful, I was not kidding. Um, so, in the interest of uh, both efficiency and expeditiousness, let's see if we can get the baseline set and the table laid so we can sit down and eat and uh, find out more about how this stuff works, what it means, what it is, and what Bermuda is going to do with and for it. Uh, with that in mind, let me please introduce our Minister of National Security, the Honorable Wayne Keynes. Please clap for him. Because uh, without him, none of this would have been possible. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. So he put up 100 chairs thinking that it would be 50 people. And clearly, um, we, didn't, we didn't plan enough. I just see such a beautiful cross-section of people. I see my Aunt Merle, the Premier's mother, that's present. And I see my godsons, Evan and Logan, who are year two students at um, Mount St. Agnes. And so we have a cross-section of people in here from well, not saying ages, but we have a really big cross-section of, of, of people here tonight, really quickly. So I've been traveling on behalf of the Bermuda government, and my mother one time asked me where I'm going. So I told her that I'm going to this blockchain uh, conference, and I'm, it's about you know, Bitcoin. And so when I return back, my mother says to me, how was your Fitbit conference? <laughs> right? And so that's when I knew we had to do something when my mother's referring to my, my voyage as a Fitbit uh, trip. Um, just before we get into it, I, I thought it important. Um, tomorrow, there are some pieces of legislation going through. And so we've been talking about it. But I think it's very important that we get the average person in Bermuda board. How can we learn? How can we grow together? What are the opportunities? And so what I've asked the team to do. And so if you're a blockchain expert, tonight it's actually not pitched for you. Tonight it's pitched so the average man and woman can learn about it. We have two local expert at, at, experts at the beginning stage. One is Glenn. Can you stand up, please, Glenn? And the other is Richard. I'm passionate about just a really, can you stand up again, Glenn? Just a really, really good story. I'm going to get mad at this. In Bermuda, we always talk about developments, right? We always talk about how we have to get, give our young people a chance. Glenn came to us and said, listen, he's really passionate in this space. He really wants to be involved in it. He starts sharing this knowledge he had about blockchain. So significant was his knowledge, we hired him on the spot. He's going off to university quite soon, and this was a chance for him to show what he did. We actually, um, I had a name for him in the office, right? And I was calling him Rupert. And he came to me and said, listen, he hates to be called Rupert. Can I really call him Glenn? So I said, listen, I'm not going to call you Rupert anymore. I'm going to call you Grasshopper. And so I told him tonight that I'm not going to call him Grasshopper. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please do not call him Grasshopper. His name is Glenn. And so Glenn and Richard, they're really, really, really conversant in this space. And what I want them to do is just to give you some knowledge, some understanding about the space. Directly thereafter, we have some, some people in the room that are going to talk about what the fintech plan looks like. In other words, what are the next steps? How do we believe this is going to be a pillar for Bermuda? By way of history, where's Troy? Troy, can you come up, please? So the premier says to me, listen, he has um, something that he wants me to do. And so people ask, why is the Minister of National Security um, involved with blockchain? Well, my, my portfolio 
is the Minister of National Security, ICT, Policy, Innovation, and E-Commerce. It's too much to say the Minister of National Security, Policy, ICT, Innovation, and E-Commerce, National Security. But part of policy, ICT, and E-Commerce, and the Department of our Computer Department. So we go off to Switzerland, and we're open in our demos in meeting people in this space and they start talking to us about what they're doing in their countries and how their countries are being being changed i was actually blown away by what were like in africa and what they were doing with uh, making countries better and with healthcare. Um, and i said you know what this is something that i believe based on what we do with reinsurance if we do it properly regulated that bermuda could be a key component in this space so people are just coming to us, hearing about Bermuda being in this space, and so we're inundated with people coming to us. The Premier had so many people in the day, we could not make everybody, so we split up into so I went to a place called Closters, and the Premier stayed in Davos, and we started meeting people. At the end of the day, we could not keep up with the something. So that day, as we were meeting to people, I said to the people in the room, listen, if you are serious about doing business in Bermuda, if you are serious about being in this space, meet us in Bermuda. This was the first day. This was the first day. 14, 14 different companies at their own expense met in Bermuda. We sat in the room and we got the and we whiteboard what we wanted in this space. At the very end of the two days, we have what we call a FinTech plan. We're going to go through that this afternoon. What I like about this space, more importantly than anything, we have companies that are setting up in Bermuda. And what we're going to do is jump the queue, and in 30 seconds, ask Troy what this company is setting up in Bermuda. But let me tell you, I think this is looking at the late as usual. Mommy, what is going to be <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we started early, right? Yeah. So, Tuesday, 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 you know, a coding course, the coding course, because of the team, it actually has a cost. And course said to me, listen, this is a really crucial program. My son has talent, my son has verve. I'm a single mom. I would love for my son to attend this course. He's really passionate about coding, but I can't afford it. Yes. So, my instructor, Troy, he said, listen, this is something that's he reached up to the moon and he covered the entire call for his son for the entire song. <laughs> that has been my experience in this space on a multiple, on a multiple levels. Troy, because a lot of people don't get it, you have any people in the world, tell them what you're doing and why you set up your company in Bermuda. First of all, you have the most beautiful country in the entire world. I, uh, I can't get enough of this place. <laughs> times now since the first time I met these gentlemen and uh, it's absolutely breathtaking in every way um, furthermore you've got two of the most brilliant men uh, technology wise but luckily enough to be in government to be you know hitting the forefront on this there's so many other countries in the space struggling to move forward but these guys are really setting the bench higher than everybody and when we were looking to establish our company somewhere in the world, I could have done it back in my home country, Canada, uh, or anywhere else. But, you know, we want to be with the best, doing the best, um, so that we're looked upon as being the best. And there's no other place than Bermuda right now. You know, legislation is really uh, key in this. And we were very slow to launch our platform um, because we wanted all the regulation, licensing, approvals, and everything so that we didn't have a difficulty moving forward, unlike a lot of other companies in this space. And we, we want to move at the pace that Bermuda is moving at, and it's just working out absolutely perfect. Couldn't be any better. Thank you, Troy. Thank you very much. So we're, we're going to get started. We have a number of other companies. See the gentleman from Bitfury that here. We have a few other companies that are up in Bermuda that are just here. Just by way of explanation, we're going to have our two local experts who are going to give the blockchain for Bermuda's ac um, explanation. Then we have John Narraway. He has on the Blockstar t-shirt and the purple plumas. Real cool. I like it. I like it. I like it. 
Yes, and John is going to give an overview of the Bermuda Plan, and then we're going to go to questions and answers. And so we're going to do questions and answers. But what we do, we have the whole team here, and so we're just going to all, we're going to all get together and answer the questions. So Richard, Richard, is your world. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give Richard a round of applause. Well, thank, thank you, Minister. Um, good evening to all uh, government ministers that are in the house. Um, forgive me the protocol. But um, by happenstance, I stumbled across this industry, right? I have an IT background, and I was uh, researching this thing called money and how it's derived and all this good stuff. But I will say that when I first got exposed to it, I was really against it. I was like fearful of it. I, didn't, I was dismissive of it. That's not me until I started really hitting the books of, on it and I started doing my own independent research and I said, this can really change the world. And I truly believe that. And I'll start with, with, with this one saying I say all the time. Technology changes everything it touches. Um, those who are, that are older than me and my, you know, my age and older can remember when we used to stick our finger in a little dial thing and used to hit the, and then just go back and stick it in another number and turn. Where are those things? They're gone. We adapted. We adapted to ATM machines, debit cards, and credit cards. So blockchain makes things easy. So I'm going to rely on technology for a second. We've, we've handpicked uh, a video that I want you to listen to. I'm going to shut up for a minute, have you listen to this video, and then I'm going to surmise after, after it's done. What if there's a technological advancement so powerful that it transforms the very basic pillars of our society? A technology which fundamentally influences the way that our economy, government systems, and businesses function, and could change our conceptual understanding of trade, ownership, and trust. This technology already exists, and it's called cryptocurrency. People often think a cryptocurrency as only virtual money or a transaction system. But if you look closer, you'll see that the monetary aspect is just the tip of the iceberg. That's because cryptocurrency is a groundbreaking internet technology for which money is merely one of the possible applications. Cryptocurrency enables a network of computers to maintain a collective bookkeeping via the internet. This bookkeeping is neither closed nor in control of one party. Rather, it is public and available in one digital ledger which is fully distributed across the network. We call this the blockchain. In the blockchain, all transactions are logged, including information on the time, date, participants, and amount of every single transaction. Each node in the network owns a full copy of the blockchain. On the basis of complicated, state-of-the-art mathematical principles, the transactions are verified by the so-called cryptocurrency miners who maintain the ledger. The mathematical principles also ensure that these nodes automatically and continuously agree about the current state of the ledger and every transaction in it. If anyone attempts to corrupt a transaction, the nodes will not arrive at a consensus and hence will refuse to incorporate the transaction in the blockchain. So every transaction is public and thousands of nodes unanimously agree that a transaction has occurred on date X at time Y. It's almost like there's a notary present at every transaction. This way, everyone has access to a shared single source of truth. This is why we can always trust the blockchain, and each cryptocurrency is both individually identifiable and programmable. This means that users can assign properties to each unit. Users can program a unit to represent a euro cent, or a share in a company, a kilowatt hour of energy, or a digital certificate of ownership. Automizing such matters leads to a considerable decrease in bureaucracy, which saves accountants, controllers, and the organization in general an incredible amount of time. But there's more. In an Internet of Things, our economy will be dealing with machines that actively participate in the economic traffic. In fact, they're already here. Think of a vending machine or drones delivering packages. These machines are unfamiliar with the concept of trust. Because of the blockchain, the drone can be 100% certain that it will deliver the package to the right recipient and know for sure that it's been paid for. And we can program the vending machine in such a way that it will automatically keep track of its supplies, 
order new supplies from the supplier, and pay for them automatically. Of course, you'll understand that this is only the beginning. Internet technology is disruptive and breaks the status quo. It opens markets and breaks the positions of middlemen all the time. The blockchain and cryptocurrencies have caused a paradigm shift. It's time to explore this new technology constructively and critically and openly discuss potential applications. And so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and so note, um, the blockchain, right? As I like to call it, I call it the full consensus distributed ledger technology. That's basically what it is. Uh, just a lengthy uh, version of the full consensus. I'm going to have a little playful thing with that in a minute. Um, so what can the blockchain do? It can change the way we store, share, and administer data and value. It provides a permanent and immutable record of data and value exchange with our central authority. It provides a protocol or platform for the de development of decentralized record keeping, contracts, and decentralized applications or computer programs. It moves the concept of trust from, from a single authority to one where the blockchain in itself is that trusted authority to avoid human manipulation and uh, corruption and fraud and things of that nature. And it also lets to empower the individual to be in control of their data and value assets. So let me just play with, with consensus for a minute. Let's do, do a little playful exercise here. In my pocket, I have a token of my economic energy, <laughs> right? Or $50 worth, right? This token of economic energy, you all are witnessing this, right? Well, I'm giving this token of my economic energy to my boy Glenn. I don't know you that well. <laughs> and so, would you, would you agree, though, that I gave him that? Did you see that? Right. So, so now I want you to tell your neighbor, and your neighbor tells the next neighbor, and, and so on and so forth. Let's pretend that happened. Did you, did you witness it? Yes? Yeah. Tell him, yes. And it goes around the room. We don't have time, right? But imagine this happening in a blink of a second. You all are on the blockchain. You are all computers, and you have witnessed the transaction. And now you now have in your head that memory cannot be erased. It's immutable. You can't take that away from you. So you can all agree that that happened, right? We're going to now put another uh, entry into the blockchain. We're going to reverse the transaction. Very important. Give me that money back. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to, and, and you witnessed that as well, right? So that's now immutable as well. So this happens on the internet, right? And on a global scale, you guys could be in different countries and whatnot, and it's permanent, immutable, non-changing. Nobody can snap our fingers and say they hypnotize you and make you forget that thing, right? But computers, as you know, they hold, you, they hold that memory and, and, and it stores it forever. So that's the thing, what, what happened. Um, um, I will say that, um, it was created in 2008 by an individual called N N Satoshi Nakamoto. That is an individual that is nameless. We don't know who he is or he, she is. She? Okay, let's stay correct. <laughs> or a group of people or a group of women, possibly. Um, we don't know. But he came up with, with the blockchain as a protocol, and it, and it definitely has changed the world. This will be many of, of many other uh, town hall meetings. But um, let me just... Um, give you a, a version on, on, on PowerPoint how it works. So a distributed ledger is a consensus of replicated, shared, synchronized digital data geographically spread across multiple sites, countries, or institutions, and there's no administrator of centralized data storage. That value token gets encrypted inside a block, and then what happens is, this is where the blockchain starts to happen. There's, that code right there is, is basically the, the, the data that's inside that block is basically scrambled or encrypted. It's mixed up, jumbled up, lack of better, you know, to describe it to you. That's what we call cryptography. That's how the blockchain is based upon. And what happens is when the next um, transaction happens, another block is added to the chain. And it's a chronological um, chain of events that changes each time. Think of these blocks as pages in a financial ledger. We're used to bookkeeping where the financial person would, would have a page of 
transactions and then the next page. Think of the blocks as pages within that ledger. And yet you go on, but it's, it, it remains, remains on the internet and it's agreed upon because of, uh, of all the computers on this blockchain agree that that is so. And it goes on and on. Now the arrow pointing to the previous, it refers back to the previous block that would make the chain um, continuous. And it goes on and on. In the case of um, some blockchains, they, they, they replicate every 10 minutes or so. So every time 10 minutes goes by, in some blockchains, it, it, a new block gets added along the way. So I'm going to end with this when time is short. But the power of blockchain technology is that algorithmically enforce private agreements and community principles at a global scale by shifting the course of trust and coordination to the network. This is what allows blockchains to, to create new markets where they couldn't exist before. So in other words, we're going to have some new markets where they didn't exist before in this country. And I applaud the government for taking the initiative for, for inviting these companies to come to our shores and domicile here. Um, this could, could rightly be the third party of, part, um, pillar of our, com uh, our, our economy. I truly believe that. But uh, it exists where it couldn't exist before, rather for political or economic reasons, hopefully both. To do this, we have, we have to be able to trust the blockchain because of the technology and also trust that no one controls it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, please clap it up for Mr. Richard Augustus, a financial historian, technologist, and blockchain expert. So do we have a better sense of how the blockchain works? Yes. Yeah, we, we, we're getting it? Yes. And uh, I, can you feel the minister's passion, though? Like, can you, can you feel the, the real potential of this to become the, the third pillar of our economy? Because one, one of the things that I took from the minister's introduction is that in the same way that for a generation or so, reinsurance, we have been a global hub for that business, we could be a global hub for the blockchain. And that keeps Bermuda in the, the economic position that, that we all aspire to, and I could not be more excited about or grateful for that opportunity existing. So, uh, let's introduce and please clap it up for this young man, Glenn Simmons, AKA Glenn Simmons. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenn Simmons, AKA Glenn Simmons. So today I want to talk about four main ideas. The first idea I want to talk about is technological progress. The second idea I want to talk about is the two internets. The third idea I'd like to discuss is the, um, the prediction for this industry and kind of the impact that this technology will have. And then the fourth idea I'd like to discuss is learning materials and certain resources that you can use and that you can look up to learn more about this new innovative technology. So a quick show of hands. Who here has used Exhibit A, a typewriter? <laughs> Fair enough. So, so, so as you as you may have heard, my generation, the millennial generation, has no idea what that is. I have never used a typewriter. So I was having a conversation last night with my mom, and she was saying, you know, she used to work in insurance, and she was a secretary. So she said, you know, back in the day in insurance, you know, I, had, I used to draft contracts and I had to sit there and kind of type out, you know, documents and I have to press it and the ink, you know, goes into the paper. And if I make a mistake, I have to get my white out or, or I have to start all over again. And I said, are you serious? <laughs> and so I was having a conversation with her and, and, and it made me think of a time when I was with my grandpa. So I'm with my papa and, um, you know, I'm at his house and it's New Year's Eve. So I'm getting ready to go out. You know, I have an outfit and I'm trying to take a picture. So I say, Papa, you know, take my cell phone. So I give my Papa my cell phone. And he's trying to take a picture. I say, you know, can you take a picture of me? So I give him my cell phone to take the picture of me. And I look at the pictures afterwards. He took 15 pictures of the floor. <laughs> I said, Papa. Well, what's going on there? I need a picture of everything. And he just doesn't understand how technology works. And so it was from that experience that that really started to make me understand like the, the, the impact and the change and the progress that technology goes through. You know, for me, I can't relate to the typewriter. 
and for my papa, he can't relate to an iPhone. And so what I want to encourage everyone to do today is to j just keep an open mind about, you know, new technology. Um, you know, this is something that's ex expected to impact the world and revolutionize the world. And different governments in different countries are using this technology in different ways. And so what I want to do today is not get too deep not get too technical, but just give you a brief overview of the impact of technology. And so the computers were, came about, the personal computer came out in about 1982, right? And that brought about the Internet of Information. So now we have information and it's readily accessible to everyone. You know, um, I can look up a news article on Bar News. I can look up a news article on the Royal Gazette. I can look up a news article on the CNN. I can send that on Facebook. I can send it on YouTube. I can send it on Twitter. This all happens virtually. Now, we don't think about this. Like, we don't really take the time to think, like, how serious that is. But that's something that's really significant. Informa in information is getting shared on the internet in a new way that previous generations would have never thought about. And that's, like, very powerful. We, we are very used to it, but it's a really powerful concept and it's a really powerful idea. So, what is blockchain? Very simply, the block, just the way that the internet was the internet of information, blockchain is the internet of value. It allows us to send value across the internet in a borderless way. So if I'm a burrito and I'd like to send value to someone in Africa, if I'd like to send value to someone in Asia or any part of the world, I can do so and it's secure, it's cheap, it's immutable, and we can trust that the value that I send is actually what it's worth. Moving along, some of the use cases. So if we look at, you know, getting a bit technical here, the smart contracts, it allows for a, a, a few new innovative business models. You know, you have digital rights, you have wages and escrow. Um, for the securities market, you have the equities, you have private markets, you have debt, crowdfunding, and derivatives. For the um, digital currencies or digital assets, you have the e-commerce platforms. Global payment platforms, peer-to-peer -peer lending. So, you know, if, if, if I'm in Bermuda and my friend is studying in the UK and, you know, he needs some more money to, 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 to help his, um, his, his self, I can send it directly to him without the need for a third party to, to um, you know, create friction in that interaction. And so that concept is another powerful idea because, you know, currently we have a lot of institutions who like to add friction to <laughs> transactions. And I'm going to let you sift that one out, but, you know. So moving forward, this, this is a bit of a high, higher level um, understanding about the impact of blockchain technology. Um, according to the World Economic Forum, um, blockchain is due to transform the global economy over the next decade. The tipping point for governments will be in 2023, but it's 2018, and Bermuda, Malta, Gibraltar, Dubai, China, Africa. Governments are moving rapidly to take advantages of the economic and technological opportunities that this technology provides. 10% of the global GDP will be in the blockchain by 2027, and it is predicted to be a $10 trillion industry by 2027. So we're talking about some serious money here. And we're talking about some serious opportunities to reshape the future in a way that the young generation um, and the older generation um, sees fit using the power of technology. So, you know, I speak with friends and I say, you know, learn a bit about blockchain, you know, do a little bit of research about blockchain. And they say, man, that, you know, that's just crazy talk, you know, I don't want to get into cryptocurrencies. There's, there's no one legitimate in the industry. EY, Deloitte, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, IBM are all using blockchain technology to provide innovative solutions for their companies. I mean, if you look at Amazon, they are using blockchain.
blockchain solutions on top of their platform. This is the largest internet company in the world that are allowing their clients, that are allowing their users to create blockchain platforms on top of their platform. Moving forward, financial services. If you look at HSBC, Citigroup, JP Morgan, you know, you have a consortium of, of, of the, biggest um, the biggest banks in the world. They're also using blockchain technology as they see the uh, economic and the technological benefits that this technology has to provide. And so I want to close um, with, with how I fundamentally believe this technology will positively impact not only Bermuda, but the rest of the world. Currently in Bermuda, as you know, we currently sit on two economic pillars, tourism and international business. There was one point in time when international business and tourism didn't exist. It took innovators, innovative thinkers, leaders to stand up to the challenge and challenge the status quo to create clarity for the citizens in Bermuda. And so what I encourage everyone to do now is to think innovatively. Don't think about the status quo. Don't think about the typewriter. Think about the computer. And with that being said, thank you so much for listening. Enjoy. Please keep clapping for Brother Glenn, AKA Brother Glenn. <laughs> Uh, for a spectacular uh, presentation. Uh, he is only 23 years old and a proud graduate of Martin Institute. And I say that as a White Academy graduate, so you know <laughs> that matters. Um, that was, uh, thank you very much for that, brother. Also for providing us all with an entirely new context in which to use the word friction. <laughs> it's new, it's classy, I dig it. <laughs> Now, uh, coming to uh, communicate with us now is John Narraway, uh, a tech entrepreneur and consultant, and one of the biggest brains in the room I am led to understand. And also, based on the public pool, is best dressed fella in, in, in the building. So please clap it up for Mr. John Narraway. <clears throat> so I just want to start out by saying I apologize. I did not attend the speech class that Minister Keynes was giving this morning because those first two were just unbelievable presentations and definitely echoes the energy that we are dealing with day in and day out. So um, my job is not to sell you on blockchain right now. So my job is to remove the Kool-Aid from everybody and let's get real about what we're trying to do here in Bermuda with this technology and try to take it in but it's been two years journey uh, for us at the BDA and looking for another pillar of the economy and boiling that down into seven minutes. So wish me luck. Um, so FinTech in itself, think of it as not an industry. Uh, we are gonna mix this up a little bit over the next couple of years, but think of it as a battle cry, okay? It's fundamentally we are at the stage where we're replumbing the financial world. We're replumbing what it means to engage as citizens on earth because it's broken right like the, we saw 2008 2009 we, we've seen it break many many times cycle after cycle and this is the next generation of this and it's some of the greatest minds are working on it and it's really really encouraging for mankind to know that it's a global movement not just something for if you will the 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 one percent this is coming from the grassroots and it's really really important so just want to take you through the kind of the journey that we've been through in two years. So we were looking for another pillar for the economy. Um, within the BDA, uh, my role is looking to the future. I spend most of my time in the future tense. Um, I'm, I have the best job in the world. Like I get to play around with AI and quantum computing and space stuff. And it's really, really cool. But the whole time we're trying to figure out, could we use this stuff in Bermuda? Could this actually have a meaningful impact in Bermuda? not for a nameplate of a law firm, which is not a bad thing to have, but ultimately so that we have a future and a future economy, and even for myself and my wife, that our kids have the ability to come back and participate in this economy doing what they really love to do, and it being in something that's diverse away from what we're currently, uh, what our two pillars are presently. So really it's about how did we identify the future opportunity. So a quick story, we thought we were really gonna push really, really hard on InsureTech 
um, last year. We spent a lot of effort looking at insure tech, and there's a lot going on in insurance tech. I mean, when we're talking about the replumbing of financial networks, the insurance industry is definitely replumbing right now. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting things happening around how you buy insurance and how you're going to be buying insurance in the future. So we thought that would be a really good area for Bermuda to play a leading role because, well, our economy is built on insurance right now. Um, and we we're going to presentations. And the interesting thing is that people were actually getting up on stage and started talking about blockchain as being core to what they were doing. And then they started talking about how they needed to raise money for their new insurance startup that they were working on. They're saying, well, we actually raised all of our money doing a token launch. And we're like looking at each other going, what's a token launch? We better figure this out. So we started digging into it and digging into it. And then by last summer, we realized this was pretty real because there was more money going into ICOs or token launches or coin launches that was going into the market for traditional venture capital. So venture capital basically is what funds startup businesses. And that's where you get the 20, 30, 40 million dollars. So to see a young entrepreneur stand up on stage and go, I've raised $40 million for my new, my new company, and you know, he can barely speak English. He's got a fantastic idea. Five years ago, he would have never been able to start up a company and hire people and make things happen, and now it's possible. So the, the opportunities for everybody to participate in this are real. Okay? Um, so we realized that this is something pretty real that we need to take uh, full advantage of. So we came back and started doing meetings and started writing papers and pulled together a task force really, really quickly and started looking at all the ways that we could move on this. And in November we formed a series of task groups uh, and we got to work. The minister mentioned we did uh, a conference in Davos and we were able to bring some of the best minds together into a room for a couple of days and we mapped out what the future of Bermuda could look like. And since then we have been it's just been non-stop, really. Um, the energy is unbelievable. We're seeing not the, not the negatives of it. We're seeing so much of the positives of it. The real companies are coming to us. The big guys are coming to us. We are, we are holding ourselves out there to say we are the quality jurisdiction. But we're not looking for everybody in this space to come to Bermuda because we realize that there's going to be a big shakeout at some point, and there's those that are ready for it and that those aren't. But the really big guys are coming to us and are really interested in what we're doing. And that's, that's proof positive that we're doing the right things and saying the right things right now. So the first thing we had to do is identify the opportunity. And we've done that really, really well. The second thing we have to do is we have to build this ecosystem. And to do that, we've looked at it, we've kind of broken it down into four areas. I, I really should have done slides because it'd be much easier. But we've broken it down into four areas. First being policy, uh, that's, that's our regulations and our laws. And we've gotten to work on that. We've done a fantastic job around building that uh, legislative framework and rules and regulations that are going to govern this. And I was, you know, tomorrow we're reading the Digital Assets Business Act for the second reading in the House tomorrow. I actually reread it this morning with fresh eyes, as fresh as you have at 8 o'clock in the morning. But I was rereading it this morning, and I realized that this is really going to be tough for them. Like, this is actually very comprehensive it is not going to be for the um, for those that are looking for a place to hide. This is definitely going to be fully transparent. This is definitely going to require physical presence for all of these companies. They are going to have to have a complement of staff here. And I think that is really, that holds well for when we start talking about jobs. They're going to have to have compliance people. They're going to have to have marketing people. They're going to have to have financial controllers in place. And that's what Bermuda's always been really, really good at. And that's an extension of what we've been able to build here within the insurance industry. The next thing we have to do is identify actually what are the right bits and pieces of this category to get involved with. And lucky for us, the companies that have been coming here have realized that Bermuda is not necessarily the tech center of the world, but we are really the compliance and regulatory world that gets technology, that we're actually open to how to manage this new world and thinking ahead five or six years in, in the regulations that we've been drafting. So when we've had companies such as Binance that have come to the island have signed, signed an agreement, they are the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. They're trading over a billion dollars a day, and they're going to be based in Bermuda. But they're not looking to necessarily do the technology here right now. They're using Bermuda for their compliance office, their global compliance office, which means they're going to use Bermuda for what Bermuda does really, really well. So I think that's a real vote of confidence in what we've been able to uh, leverage from our history. 
Next thing is capital, you know, capital access is absolutely important. We have to have access to capital to make things happen. And you can see that, you know, from the people that have been coming to the island and have been looking to work with Bermuda, that they're interested in more than just having a business here, that they really want to engage in the community. They want to make things happen. They want to make sure that we are in a position to educate the people of Bermuda, not just young people, but all people in Bermuda, we train and make things happen. And that brings up the last point, which is talent. This is a really big opportunity for Bermuda. Bermuda. And there's the saying that, you know, luck is, you know, 50% preparation and 50% opportunity. Um, I think that holds true in any case. And in this case, it's absolutely true that, you know, we are prepared in so many aspects of this. And we just have to make sure that our young people are ready to go, that we're encouraging them to explore every option possible the next couple of years, to take advantage of everything that comes along in, ter in terms of training, whether it's here or away. And ultimately, what we've been talking about is, how do we also reverse the brain drain? How do we bring back the Bermudians that are working overseas that you know, perhaps weren't that interested in working in a reinsurance, but might be really excited to work in these new industries? So then number three, how do we support this ecosystem? And again, it's all of us working together. It's all of us as an island being welcoming, to being encouraging, to not getting this confused with what the latest story was in the Wall Street Journal, but actually realizing that this is a real industry, this is a real movement, and that Bermuda is leading the charge, as we always have around financial regulation. So with that, I want to thank everybody for being here. I've it's standing room only. It's so encouraging to see everybody here. So thank you very much. So uh, please clap a little more for Mr. Maraway. <laughs> thank you. And uh, if we can get all the speakers and the rest of the... Oh, I forgive me. We will get to the... Uh, especially interesting component of the evening, which is to say the question and answer in a second. Uh, please welcome the minister back to close out the presentation. Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to go through a few of the legislative pieces and talk about how I think that we can all benefit from the opportunity. And so we passed a couple of weeks ago the ICO part of the legislation, which was an amendment to the Companies Act. An ICO is simply a way of raising a, ra a way of raising money in a non-traditional way. And so the ICO legislation that we passed put law and legislation around setting up an ICO or a fund or an ICO in Bermuda. And that has gone through the House, it's gone through the Senate, it's received the Royal Assent. And so people now are coming to Bermuda to set up their company. Simply, if you have, you want to do, my mom would love to start a, a hairdressing business, right? Um, Aunt Merrill, don't tell nobody. And she wants to bring in rigs, but she needs to raise some money. Well, she can set up an ICO in Bermuda and literally do that fund, actually raise that money in Bermuda. And now companies are coming from all over the world based on the legislation that we have put in place. We are the first country on the planet to have ICO legislation. And so when a person wants to raise money in a non-traditional way, they are now doing that in Bermuda. People are doing this on a daily basis. They're waiting. We're just about to get some regulations out. And people are waiting in poll positions to come and do their non-traditional ICO uh, currency raises in Bermuda. We believe that is significant because that puts Bermuda in poll position. Now, people are saying, why, when we have Bermuda is an international center of finance, why would it be allowing this tenuous, this dodgy, this potentially dangerous element of finance into Bermuda? Why would you be doing that? And Bermuda is going through an international accreditation for, uh, for our financial uh, stability. Why would you guys be playing around this if there, are, if there are being so many bad actors in this place? One thing I reflected on was a conversation that I had with uh, two of our reinsurance leaders, Brian Dupereau and Brian O'Hara. They were in New York and they were at a conference and they said to me, listen, 40 years ago when we were younger men, we were doing the exact same thing when we were, they were setting up the reinsurance industry in Bermuda. What we need to focus on is to make sure that from a regulatory standpoint that Bermuda is covering itself and making sure that it is safe, that we are keeping out bad actors, and that we are putting all the legislation and the regulation in place. Loretta. So, 
I'm not going to ask Loretta to speak, but Loretta is a global expert in uh, this area. She has given, um, she is for the IMF, for the OECD, for the Australian government, for about 15 countries around the world, including Mauritius. She is, she is the global expert on regulation. He sat with the Bermuda team and people from all around the world and we put together this legislation. Now how this normally happens is that a minister and a, a few uh, technocrats get in a room and they write the legislation. We didn't do that on this time. We got, had the benefit of leading experts from all around the world. Everyone, he opens up to everyone in the world and says, listen, this is what we want to do in the world. As a matter of fact, we want to create something that is already being called the Bermuda Standard. This is making sure that everything is enshrined in law, that we have a policy for setting up your company in Bermuda, going to a corporate services provider, vetting the white papers, vetting the blue paper, looking at all the technical specs from it, and then making a decision whether or not these companies are allowed to set up in Bermuda. This process has been vetted, it has been looked at, and we believe that we have set up something that we believe is the global goal standard in keeping with our international best practice reputation that we've done for years in the reinsurance and the financial services market. The next part is that is the, the ICO legislation. The next part is the DABA, the Digital Asset Business Act. The second reading will actually take place tomorrow. So tomorrow you will see a supplement in the Royal Gazette when it comes to dealing with currency exchanges and tokens. This is an act that will govern how these people conduct and do business in Bermuda. This act was written by the Bermuda Monetary Authority. So when people say, well, listen, this is so risky. Well, we said, we actually we acknowledge that. But how we've mitigated that is by having our independent regulatory agency, the Bermuda Monetary Authority, they have written a comprehensive act looking at how we set this up. And so the first part is, what are we going to do in Bermuda? We believe that companies setting up ICOs, that they're going to do these initial coin offerings, and they're going to set up these companies in Bermuda. In this room right now, we have several companies that are interested, that have set up their initial coin offerings and are setting up their businesses actually in this room tonight. Yes? These companies are going to come to Bermuda. They're going to set up. Segue. How does this benefit for me? How, does, how do I add benefit? Well, it will benefit you if you are in the IT spaces. If you are an office manager, if you are in marketing, if you want to uh, get involved in computer programming, there are so many different elements for people to be involved in this new field. Well, you know what? I can't afford to be in you know, my kids in school. Well, we've signed two MOUs of two separate companies, and each of them have pledged combined $20 million for education in this space. What does that mean? What does that mean? Cole, we can now pay for some young men to come to your school to do coding this summer. We can go into our schools and we can partner with our community schools to make sure that everybody is getting upgraded. If you have a child and they want to study anything to do with technology, we now have the ability to send people away to school. Or you might be working at a help desk in a company and you want to transfer those skills over, but you're going to need a little help doing a couple 12-week courses. We're saying that we now have gotten from the people that have set up in Bermuda, we now have the ability to get people trained to be in these spaces. It's exciting. I received a call from a lady the other day. Um, Binance is one of the biggest exchanges in Bermuda. They have committed to setting up in Bermuda in the first year, in the first six months, hiring 40 Bermudians. A lady, she contacts me the other day, said, Mr. Kane, somebody's um, work playing a prank on me. I'm like, please explain. Well, somebody's calling me about a job or somebody's hacked my, um, one of my Instagram accounts. So I, I understood what she was saying. She said to me, listen person from an uh, uh, HR company reached out to me and asked me, saw my interest on, on uh, LinkedIn, and they've asked me, do I want to be hired by this company, Binance? I reached out to the CEO in Binance and said, listen, you have to check your website. People are actually reaching out to Bermudians and making them these crazy offers, and I just don't want people to lose confidence in what you guys are doing. He said, that's not um, anybody being foolish. That's actually my team just reaching out to Bermudians to see if they need an opportunity. 
And so literally, this guy was just on LinkedIn hitting Bermudians profiles and asking them doing online interviews and basically picking up people uh, to be on our team. I actually know somebody that's in this room right now that was recently hired by one of these companies, Salt, and was given an opportunity. And so the, the hiring is now to st start taking places. Companies are now starting to come to Bermuda. So the first phase is the ICO part, that is people doing initial coin offerings and setting up their companies in Bermuda. The next, f the next phase is the DABA, the Digital Asset Business Act. That will be the second reading in the House in Parliament tomorrow. Listen to me tomorrow. They're going to ask some difficult questions. How are we going to protect our infrastructure? How are we going to make sure bad actors don't come to Bermuda? We will have to account for that in Parliament tomorrow. That will start at approximately lunchtime tomorrow, just after lunch tomorrow. Listen to the debate. You understand more now after you've heard this conversation. There are people that want to set up something called exchanges. There are people that want to do token offerings. And that, this, that legislation is everything that governs that. How you conduct this business in Bermuda. It sets up the, the ability for the Bermuda government to regulate it. It puts periods of incarceration if you break the, break the act. A requirement, a requirement for these companies to have a... Uh, uh, physical presence in Bermuda and to have significant members of their staff in Bermuda. The next part that we're going to do is um, incubators. An incubator or an accelerator is you have a good idea and you might want to set up a company but you want to do uh, you want to do a company but you're not sure if this is something that has legs or if this is something that's going to uh, 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 be commercially viable. So we want to set up an incubator where people can come to Bermuda with all of their ideas, where they, where they can come with all of their dreams, their aspirations, and we're, we're going to set up incubators. And there are companies in Bermuda that have been reaching out where their buildings, are, they're going to partner, and where their laboratories, where people are going to be able to come and set up uh, companies in Bermuda. I received a call from a company in London last night. And they said, listen, they're really excited in Bermuda. They're going to set up the ICO, the, the fundraising I, uh, element in Bermuda. They already uh, sourced a local law firm. But they said, you know what? To see if I want to stay in Bermuda, do you have a place where I can actually just put three people in Bermuda just to see what ideas we can, we can bounce off the people in the room? The reason why an incubator is so crucial, because you can have 30 different companies in one room. Remember the old Silicon Valley? So if you're in a room and you're, you're saying, okay, this works, or this doesn't work, and you have 30 companies in a room, we believe there's a synergy. And suppose if one or two of those companies become the next Amazon or the next Google, well, we're hoping that they will stay in Bermuda. And so the incubator concept, the ICO, companies doing initial coin offerings in Bermuda, setting up exchanges. The next thing that the government is doing that is actually flying is the incubator, where you have a concept, where you have something that you want to do, and you set up your incubator, and you set up your team in Bermuda. And there are a few local companies that are doing it. The government is doing something. We've, the government has recently purchased Park Place. That is the building right next to Marketplace, which IAS used to be in if you're going towards um, the post office. The building right next to Marketplace. The government has purchased that building, which houses the Bermuda Housing Authority, the Bermuda Housing Corporation at the bottom. The top floor, we have put that aside for a co-working space. A lot of people want to come to Bermuda and do business, do business, but they don't necessarily want to buy a building or they don't necessarily have the money to buy a space. We're saying that you can rent two chairs or you can rent, um, have your board meetings here. And that already before we have gotten off the ground, a company called and they said, listen, can we pay for that? It's going to take us about a million to re redo the building. A company called, listen, stop, 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 stop. We really like what you guys are doing. Can my company sponsor and actually build this thing uh, for the people of Bermuda? And so we see this space. We see that there's a, there's a good bit of opportunity. Go on to fintech.bm. Reach out uh, to anybody if you want opportunities, if you want the opportunity to retool. We have partnered, and the Minister of Education is traveling. We have partnered, we're partnering, in the process of partnering with an overseas company. They are behemoths in training people technically. What we want to do with this overseas company is partner with them and for them to embed in Bermuda. And if a person comes in, that team will train Bermudians and get them ready for a bunch of different technological and technical um, jobs. We went to New York and we saw this company and we saw coders, uh, help desk people. We saw every, I mean, it was literally 200 people working in this business, but the leading people in this space were being trained by these companies. So if you are Google and you want if you are Google and you want 
two Alcatraz people or you want two coders, you don't go anywhere over the world. You go to this company who, you, who you've partnered with and you say, listen, I want these three people. This company is going to be like, Roger that. I got these three people in Bermuda. We are going to give you 12 weeks, three months, and guess what? You don't have to go looking anywhere around this world. We are going to train these people in Bermuda, in Bermuda for this opportunity. And so what the partnership looks like is people that need opportunities, need education, need retooling. We think that this is an awesome opportunity. I'll be the first person to hold up my hand. I do not believe that this is a magic bullet. With $2.4 billion in debt, I don't think that this is, 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 is kumbaya time and they're going to make a statue of, of the premier done by Johnny Barnes. <laughs> I believe that this is a step in the right direction. <laughs> I came into a space, and guess what? The average Bermudian that's a little younger than me they know three times as much as me about this space. There is a Bermuda Crypto Facebook group. These are some of the most brilliant minds in this space, and it's like 150 Bermudians on it. And they, everything that I'm telling you, they can do so in their sleep. And so, so that you know, there are, are a number of Bermudians that are really excited and they're really passionate about. The last thing that I'm most passionate about, so people keep using this word cryptocurrency. You notice that I have, we are using the word fintech. We believe that with our reinsurance model in Bermuda, we believe that reinsurance companies that want to put that on the blockchain and do it with reinsurance, that they're going to come to Bermuda and use all the expertise of the people in this room, and they're going to do that through RegTech. We met a company last week in Bermuda that they are a medical technology company. They want to come and they want to get a drop of blood from everybody in this room. They can tell if you have Alzheimer's, dementia. They want to take all of that information and they want to put that on the blockchain. Wait, why is that important? Well, imagine if everywhere around the world we can take everybody's medical records that are in Africa and only have acute care, but they don't have to keep their records. But now we can put all of those records on the blockchain. And pharmaceutical companies that want information about hypertension and, and about all these uh, uh, specific injuries that plague specific communities, if they can come to Bermuda and all of that information is on the record in Bermuda. Is Bitfury in the house? Bitfury? Where's Bitfury? Is he here? Bitfury is a team that's in Bermuda, and they're partnering with us to put our land title registry on the blockchain. Everybody's got a, a cousin in this room. You've been fighting over that house. You didn't spoke to your cousin in five years because the older brother took the house, and you know the boundary don't belong to you, and so you haven't spoke to your cousin in three years because your, fight, your, 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 your family's fighting over the deeds. My mama keeps her deeds in a box under the bed. And so, and so, when you want to get, um, there's no central repository of our deeds. We're saying, Bermuda, let's get with it. We're looking at a plan. The team is actually in the room today. They're looking at a plan of putting this on the blockchain. You can't change it. You can look at it any time. It's safe. And you can then see what it is. And there are so many ways that we can use this blockchain to act fit mankind. I believe through medicine and the developing world, putting information on the blockchain, education on the blockchain, and you, you saw how it works. I believe that Bermuda could be at the forefront of changing the world. Every, we are all prone to think about blockchain and fintech with reference to cryptocurrencies. I actually believe that is a huge money earn up for this country. But I ask you, my people, my fellow Bermudians, do not focus on that. I believe that we can change humanity through blockchain technology. I believe we can, listen, check this out. I believe the majority of the world who are unbanked, who do not have the ability to be educated, I believe that the benefit and the greatness in this technology are getting young people in the rest of the world that will never get education, that will never get medicine, never have the red, uh, medical uh, records, who will never have to be banked. I believe that this is how the blockchain and this technology will change the world. How do we, how do we find ourselves in this? Bermuda, just like we are in reinsurance, in England, out of every 14 cars on the road in England, three of them are insured out of Bermuda. After 9-11, the then President Bush called seven uh, leaders, business leaders in the world to come and to see how New York would get bailed out of all of the money. 
Do you know he called two CEOs of two Bermudian companies out of that number? In other words, this country has always punched above its weight. We didn't do this by osmosis or by being just nice people. People come to this country because we are well regulated. Why did Troy and his team come to Bermuda? Because we have a legal system that is second to none. Because we have professionals. Because we have a trusted, legitimate government. That we, they can look what are the pillars of success why they will come to Bermuda. They would say Bermuda is the third largest reinsurance entity on the planet. So they will look at the success that we've had in those areas and they say, of course we will come to Bermuda. Look at what they've done over the last 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to build on that. Sound regulation. Like um, John said, everybody that wants to set up a company, guess what? They're not going to necessarily make it in Bermuda. If you're a bad actor, we have rules and regulations. Have a look at the act. It's online. You're not going to be able to come to Bermuda and play in our sandbox if you are badly behaved. The legislation has caveats and things in it where you will go to prison. And we've done everything in our power to show the world that Bermuda is not only serious about it, is that Bermuda is ready and open for business. I believe that if it was easy, everyone will be doing it. We are the first country on the planet to regulate ICOs with legislation. Tomorrow, the Digital Asset Business Act, which I call the DABA, will have its second reading in the House where we will debate it. Guys, monumental stuff. What I want to do now is call up some of the people, Sean, uh, Loretta, John, um, if there's anybody else on the team here, and we're going to take questions from the audience. We have about 15 minutes, and then we can call it a night. If you're thirsty, we have water in the back and some snacks in the back. We're going to go easy on the sugar. We know about the sugar tax, so <laughs> we have water. I don't want to go against another. Uh, and I want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge the premier in his absence. Um, I want to acknowledge the premier in his accent. Truly, he is the he is the push behind this. As many you, as many of you may or may not know, the premier has a master's in computer science from George Washington University. He is a bohemian in this space, and so when your leader is a technologist and he lives in this space, it is it is not a Herculean feat to push him in a space that he lives in every day. And we operate under his behest with his guidance. And I'd just like to thank him in his absence for his his, his work with this. All right, thank you very much, Minister. <laughs> All right, so uh, as the Minister shared, we are here for the question and answer period. So if you have a question, put your hand up, I will come to you, and we will communicate as a community. If they could kindly explain the difference between the ICO and the IPO. Uh, did we get that question, everybody? If we could uh, describe the difference between an ICO and an IPO. Okay, so really quickly, uh, difference between an IPO and an ICO. So uh, an IPO tends to be something that happens with a company when it reaches a certain amount of maturity. Usually it's after it's, re it's defined what its product is, it has a track record, and they're looking to do a major expansion, so they're going to go to a public market and say, we have value, would you like to buy into this because we think our value is going to go up? And that usually happens as in a mature company. It's a way of raising additional capital uh, at, at a later stage for that company. ICOs are a little bit different in that they're looking to raise money to actually build their idea. So it's highly, highly speculative. But the idea is that coming out of the gates, we're going to give you a token of value that we think when our idea really does take off in the future, that that's going to be tradable for something. Kind of like. Um, Kind of like buying iTunes cards before they build the iTunes store <laughs> is kind of what they're doing. So they're pre-funding their business. They're, they're saying, we have a really good idea. If you like the idea good and, you know, well enough, throw a little bit of money our way. We'll give you something in return. Highly speculative. Could go good, could go bad. That's what it is. So buyer beware. Fully, you know, we've got to be legit about it. Buyer beware. But that's the fundamental differences. Time's up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Well, first and foremost, uh, I think I can safely say that no matter what, uh, Minister Keynes is definitely going to be uh, giving a speech at my wedding because I, I, I need a hype man like you in my life. 
um, but, but more, more seriously, um, I, I kind of look around the room and I see a lot of people that I've seen uh, at the FinTech Summit early on today or some of the other town hall meetings. So it's pretty safe to say that we're, we're slowly developing a bit of a cult uh, around this, which is, which is quite impressive. Um, that, that being said, Minister, you, you've addressed the, the points around education, around the fact that there's no, been no sort of template regulation for us to follow. And then the naysayers as well. So I'm curious, what, what in your opinion, has been our, our biggest challenge hurdle, et cetera, in, in, in sort of this, this early adoption in, in what is FinTech? So I don't like to use the word naysayers. I think that the, the, the concern, the reticence, the apprehension around it, I believe that it's justified. I believe that it's very important that we get this right. So sometimes you, you hear a debate in the House and you hear the, the opposition and, and the government clash shorts with reference to this area. That is healthy. That's a huge part of the Westminster system. But more importantly, when people raise the concerns in this space, I believe that makes us dot our I's and cross our T's. I think the biggest challenge in this space is exactly why we're here tonight, just learning more about it. And so when, you, when somebody says cryptocurrency, so I like to show billions. Anybody ever watch billions? So I'm watching billions this weekend, right, as you do. And it's a scene where my, where my favorite character, he is... Um, doing something dodgy, right? So he, he does an illegal uh, business deal and he says to the guy at the end, I'm not going to pay you in cash. Here's a key. I'm going to pay you in cryptocurrency. And I was horrified. I'm like, no! We're trying to do this in the middle right? Right? Where there is so, there, there is so much uh, misinformation in this space and I think um, our responsibility is to get Bermudians away from this cryptocurrency talk and into the fintech talk and to show the world what Bermuda could be. And so if we, do, if we did anything tonight, we want to show Bermuda that just like we evolved into the reinsurance space, med tech, reinsurance tech, we want to start looking at all the different opportunities. So if you have a pharmaceutical company, we want you to set up, you know what, we want to see what the possibilities are in Bermuda. And if we alleviate all the focus on cryptocurrencies, I believe that we, we will make some huge advances as a country. And if I could just add to that, you know, right now this space isn't regulated at all anywhere. Um, lots of countries are trying to find a solution for it. The U.S. in particular is having a really hard time with it because you've got the federal level of regulation and then you've got all the state level regulation. And it's just, it's impossible to, for the two to meet. Um, a nimble place like Bermuda that has this sort of reputation for being solid regulated uh, jurisdiction is really, the, the, it's the smaller countries like ourselves that are going to be the early adopters here and are going to be the ones that can set it up properly and, and, and correctly out of the gate. So this is a great opportunity for us. We're not alone here. There are other countries that are right on our heels, nipping at our heels, like Singapore, that are working on, on creating these, these uh, regimes similarly. And, and Mauritius, and you know, Loretta knows all of them. Um, you know, and this is, this is where we're going to actually set ourselves apart. So I think you know, the BMA is doing a fantastic job. All right. Uh, Sir, uh, just before you pass the mic, could you introduce yourself to the oh, crowd? So sorry, we are. Uh, Sean Moran from the Bermuda Business Development Agency. I work with John. All right, thanks, yes. sir. One thing, um, I, I noticed that, Kent, you was mentioned of the whole issue of cryptocurrencies, and there seems to be a problem because of the FUD that's around it, right? But at the same time, you're dealing with ICOs, you're dealing with cryptocurrencies, because uh, really that, that's what it comes down to. You're going to fund, you're looking for a means of funding somebody's adventure. And at the end of the day, these, these tokens, which is cryptocurrency, these tokens are being traded on Binance, which you mentioned. And um, I think more so people just need to be educated to the fact that cryptocurrencies is not a problem. I think it's just that at the end of the day, you do have bad actors in this space. It's new technology, and you will have that. But if people take all time to investigate the technologies that they themselves are looking to invest in, because to some extent, it is an investment. You're gonna be putting money towards someone's idea and at the end of the day, looking to recuperate um, some reward at some point or use that token to buy that service. So on the one hand, I think, it's, first of all, it's for, it's for everyone to do their own research and to find out what it is. I'm into, uh, I've been buying cryptocurrencies for a while now, but at the same time, I spend some time researching different companies to find out what their company's offering is, who the, who the, um, um, who the team is, that's, that's involved in pulling it off, maybe they've done something in the past that can help you, you know, figure out where these guys are going 
and if they have a current product. So it might be a, a sense where you may have to wait uh, if you think it's a great idea. And at the same time, it may be something you can move on because it's early. And you just know that these people have the background, the expertise from something they've done in the past. So, so just, just interrupting you, yeah. just interrupting you, I think the government has a responsibility to minimize bad actors being in that space. I think when a company sets up an ICO, I think we have to look, open the kimono, and look who the, who, what the fund is being raised for. Who are the people? You know, we have to hold them accountable for setting up in Bermuda. Like, is it the Latin is caveat viemta, by a beware. I think that's important, but when you set up a regula regulatory body, um, which will be the Bermuda Monetary Authority for, for, for um, digital assets, we believe that it's very important when a company sets up a digital asset for us to know who the players are what the fund is being raised for, to look at all of the players in that fund. If you're going to set up in Bermuda, you can't do it from, from Russia. You have to have a fiscal presence with some of your key players in Bermuda. I actually agree with everything that you said, right. but in order for us not to fall afoul with our international regulators, yeah. not to fall afoul with, the, with our international bodies, we have to make sure that we put the regulatory elements in place really quickly. The biggest thing in this space that we have to protect is called AML, KYC, anti-money laundering, and know your customer. This is the space where everybody's saying, how will you protect the people that are coming to Bermuda? How will you make sure that information is, 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 is correct? Uh, we have to make sure that everyone coming in this space, because when people look, when the regulated bodies look at Bermuda, they want to see that Bermuda is being overtly protective of the regulatory environment. And that's why we believe that we have to be so hardcore to coin a phrase with the regulation. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for that, Minister. I, I uh, want to exercise a little moderator's privilege, if I may. Um, can I get a show of hands with folks that know what cryptocurrency is? Well, okay, so not everybody, not really. Could we explain what cryptocurrency is? Because that is distinct and separate from blockchain technology. And clarifying the, the distinction between the two, I think, is, is key. Oh. <laughs> So, so I'll have a go at that. Um, I'm Loretta. Excuse my accent, because I'm Australian. Um, so, so cryptocurrency was the first application of blockchain. Blockchain is the underlying technology um, of, of these things that we're talking about. So cryptocurrency is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value between me and you. So it's like me walking up to you, giving you that and taking your pen. We've done an exchange. It, it has no middleman between us. We've just done that. And it's whatever we perceive that value to be. So is my bottle of water worth your pen? I don't know. But um, <laughs> fair, fair currency has a value on it because it's issued by governments. So a cryptocurrency is a barter. It's an exchange. Whether I think what, I'm, what my bottle of water is worth or whether it's the pen, that's all it is. So we're talking about a commodity. And, and commodities came out of money. So long, long, long time ago in history, um, people used to barter for, for wheat, for corn. And they're going back to the Egyptians, that got really hard. And then people started to use things like coins or pieces of stone. That got too difficult too. And then we moved on to things like gold. So eventually, 400 years ago, we had systems where government said, we'll issue pieces of paper that have written on it that this is worth a certain amount of value. So, so that's how what Money actually essentially came out of a cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency is the first application of the blockchain. But what the blockchain is, it's the underlying technology. And it's, it, the technology itself is a lot of, it's the extension of the internet. So the internet gave us um, the ability to transfer data between each other. But the one thing the internet didn't do was make us transfer that securely. So Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency. And what Bitcoin did, it was a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value. Bitcoin solved the one problem, or two problems actually in history. One was um, when you go into a bank and you give them your money, they give it to somebody else. So Bitcoin solved what they call the double spend problem. I can't spend my Bitcoin or give it to somebody else without it actually existing. And the other thing Bitcoin did, it's the new security protocol of the internet. So the first time in history, this transfer of my bottle of water digitally and the pen is secure. And it's secure because the database is decentralised. So that security protocol, that security layer of, of what Bitcoin did for the world is phenomenal. So now we can move value, but we can move it securely. 
And you all probably don't know that I'm, the man that actually built the inter internet is a man called Robert Kahn. He's a very good friend of mine. And he didn't really mean to build the internet. He, all he did was building a messaging system for, um, for services in America, for different armed forces. So, and I said to him, so what is this? And he said, yeah, one thing I didn't solve was the security. Um, and you don't know, since the day that he actually built the internet, there is something like 29 different protocol levels that sit above, above, above that. We just use the internet every day, nobody cares. So what you found with Bitcoin, it, it was the first security protocol. So it's actually solved the security of the internet. Now what happens in the next 10 years, you're going to have protocols develop. So by the time we even talk about this in 10 years, it's not going to be an issue, but we will have a new security level of the internet. So that's what the cryptocurrency is and that, that's how it actually changed what we're talking about. So this is actually effectively the next generation of the internet. All this is is a move of, of making a transfer of data like we use the internet secure. Does that answer the question? Why Just so Do you want to repeat the question? No, you repeat. Oh, okay, so you're asking me. Okay, so what, why is there a fluctuation? So every asset class is tradable. Um, whether you trade gold, whether you trade your real estate, whether you trade a commodity, everything um, we put a, a value on. So um, cryptocurrencies actually don't trade on securities exchanges. They, they trade on thing called um, cryptocurrency exchanges. Now, the word exchange is not very good because um, we all you know what a stock exchange is. When you, when you go into a stock exchange, um, there's a process called novation. So the stock exchange stands between me and you doing a transaction. So what we're actually talking about is digital marketplaces. This is just, these exchanges are just marketplaces where you and I go and exchange our coins or our cryptocurrency. Um, it's very new. And you know, people ask me all the time, would you invest in cryptocurrency? I don't know. Like, do you, I shouldn't be giving anyone advice because it's what you perceive. Why do you go and buy a bottle of wine that you go and trade because you think it's going up? Why do you buy a piece of land? So everything has a value to what you and I perceive it to. So people trade these things because they think that they're going to, yeah, they're going to make money. And you can trade cryptocurrencies between other cryptocurrencies. You can trade it as money. It's very volatile because it's a very, very young industry. Very, very young. And... Um, Nothing in, what the, in life that we all do is without risk. So you just remember that every time you, you, you go and put money into something, you only ever put as much money as you, you can afford to lose. So we all have to understand what risk is um, and risk profiles of trading things like cryptocurrencies is very volatile and can be very dangerous. So um, why, do they, why are they volatile? Because people perceive their value to be very different. My um, question um, is... Uh principally, I guess, to the government of Bermuda, the minister. Um, I'm very cautious uh, I'm very cautious about this whole scenario primarily because it occurred to me that it could be a glorified pyramid scheme. Another another something that's come to the island to to drain and suck our blood, so to speak. And so I'm very skeptical and very um, cautious about the move that we're that we are about to make in that regard. Um, just two questions. That's an observation that can be addressed as well. But the other the other issue was um, every business comes to this island with a glorified idea of we're going to provide uh, job opportunities for regions, education, the whole nine yards. The gaming the gaming or gambling lot have done the same thing. Those who want to put drugs are doing the same thing. Those who doing alcohol are doing the same thing. And so this is what creates all this iffiness in my head. Um, have the principals involved in this particular trading, have they, uh, for our endorsement, Bermudian endorsement, Bermudian government endorsement, have they given us $500 million to pay for our endorsement of a product that is, at this point, still phantom for us? It's like ghost, it's phantom. You have no real, we have no real, no tangible stuff in our hand to say uh, this is what it is. In other words, we, we've endorsed them, but I don't see anywhere where anyone has said we've given you uh, $300 million to come into your port, and, but we have your endorsement. I'm not going to talk about what may happen under the table or because I, because I know that you're doing better business than that. I've listened to you very carefully, 
my question still hinges on the fact that their endorsement, are they getting our endorsement free, or are they going to pay for our endorsement since we're going through legislative, we're taking up time, we're taking up money, we're taking energy, we're flying all over the place. Uh, are these people paying for our endorsement? And secondly, but very importantly, is this another glorified pyramid scheme which has done so much injury to so many people? Do we have to get in and get what we can and get out? Or are we going to be sucked in and forced to remain there and, 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 and? Very, so you've asked the questions that nobody else has asked, right? Normally what happens, somebody puts that on the Royal Gazette anonymously. To your credit, you have stood up in a room with your peers, your family, and your friends, and you've asked a question directly. For that, I respect you. Huh? That, that, that's, that's huge. So here's the thing. We can't take any of this personally. This is a new world. The reason why you he you've heard me stress 15 times tonight that we're not saying the cryptocurrency stuff, but using that as our flagship, we are saying fintech. What does fintech mean? Fintech is simply the ability for somebody with a technology-based company to set up in Bermuda. So tomorrow, the first thing we said, we're going to look at incubators, people setting up companies in Bermuda. When a company wants to, let's just go back, let me go back, to set up an ISPO, an initial coin offering in Bermuda. There is a vetting process. Under the Companies Act, there are specific legal hurdles that have to take place when a person is incorporated. Under the Companies Act. The ICO Act is an extension of the Companies Act. So there are legal provisions the entire way through the Act that will govern, protect, and hold the people accountable that are setting up businesses in Bermuda. So not some ICOs. Every single company has to go through a vetting process. That vetting process includes a name. They have to get a corporate service provider, which is a law firm that sets up their company. They have to watch this. They have to be vetted by the Bermuda Monetary Authority. The Bermuda Monetary Authority, if you are a business from Africa, they have to go to the equivalent of the Bermuda Monetary Authority in Africa. They have to look at their financial proceedings. They have to look at how you govern yourself. They have to look at all the laws and regulations of that country. Before you get issued a license in Bermuda, all of those criteria have to be met, right? Check this out, before you even be given a license. To, to, to do an ICO raise. After you've been given permission to get in the race, you have to do something that is called a white paper. Your white paper sets out what is the money going to be raised for, which will get rid of your pyramid themes. It sets up what is the paper, what is the business going to be used for? Who are the key people in the entity? What are the roles and the responsibilities? After the person submits the white paper, they still don't get it. The white paper is vetted by the FinTech Advisory Committee. The FinTech Advisory Committee, to prevent the bad actors from coming in, they look at your business plan line upon line, precept upon precept, and they say that this business gets the license. Yes? And that's how people get in the space. People can set up a company in Bermuda. If somebody does an MOU, a, a, a memorandum of understanding, and they come forward, they're saying that they want to, they believe in Bermuda as a gesture of good feel. They're just doing an initial indi indicator. Nobody's telling them that they have to do it, that they want to do and help education in Bermuda. With the greatest res respect, I reject the Ponzi scheme or reject the pyramid scheme because it's based on nothing. If a person says they want to do a raise and they want to raise money, well, guess what? They're just simply saying they want to raise money. When it comes to the actual cryptocurrencies or the digital assets, there is a law, the Digital Asset Business Act, that governs that. Tomorrow, listen on the radio, right? That's when we go in line by line. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. So if a company wants to set up in Bermuda and they want to do a token offering or they want to set up an exchange, the D DABA, the Digital Asset Business Act, that sets up all the rules, the ways, how we govern business. It has huge $100,000 fines. It has periods of incarceration. And if you are a bad actor, guess which space you're not going to want to be in? You're not going to want to be in a heavily regulated space like Bermuda. And so when people start talking about um, how risky it is, we believe we've mitigated the risk. No one else in the world has laws surrounding cryptocurrency. It's the wild, wild west. The Bermuda said, remember, the act was written by the Bermuda Monetary Authority, an independent agency. So Ben and David can't go in and take in your money. 
This is regulated by an independent entity, the Bermuda Monetary Authority. Yes? And so tomorrow when you listen to the act, we, we, will, sh we will see. I mean, you'll be challenged by it, and challenge is good. But we have to show how this thing is going to benefit the people of Bermuda. Go back. I'm going to go back in the helicopter for a minute. If we focus on cryptocurrencies only, it's not going to work. If we focus on changing the world, innovation, technology, education, and everybody comes from Silicon Valley. That's where everybody went in, in the early 2000s, where the innovators were. We're saying to the world, guys, come to Bermuda. We do it well. We have a good law. This is where all the great minds are going to be. Companies are setting up incubators all over the place. Come to Bermuda. What we want Bermudians to do, right? We want Bermudians to be ready to, if they're working in, and they've been laid off, we want you to be willing to go to and get retooled. Oh, I can't afford it. We just got 20 million. Give us a chance to put together a body that will transparently allow you to uh, manage this money. Give us an opportunity to, to set that up. But the key is that people are going to come to Bermuda. And for the first time in a very long time, we've been hearing about jobs leaving and jobs leaving and jobs leaving and people leaving. For the very first time in a long time, we have one word that I love. It's hope. It's hope. I believe that we are not out the woods yet. I believe that we're going to learn. We're going to bump our heads a few times. We are talking about an industry that is... It's new, and it's developing. We're building this team every day. I, the Premier and I spoke today. We can continue to do it. We all have day jobs. And so in the beginning, when this was all an ideology or when it was all thought, we were just running around doing it. We actually cannot keep up with the amount of people that are coming to Bermuda. We have to have six and seven people on the email stream because so many companies are coming to Bermuda. We have to get in the office at dawn and leave at night. This hasn't happened in 20 years, 30 years. We have to we have to make the most of it. Thank you, Minister. Uh oh. Uh oh. Now this is the smartest person in the room, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> this is the brightest person in the room. Oh, thank you, Minister. That's quite an introduction. Uh, my name is Jamie Thane. I'm the CTO of East End Group and uh, that's quite that's hard to follow, isn't it? The, uh, my question is <laughs> um, I've been a technologist for forty years. And I've seen four great shifts. And the first one was the PC. And the second one was uh, the internet. The third one was a ubiquitous operating system. And the fourth one's blockchain. So for those of you that are engaged, and she gave you a really detailed dissertation of what blockchain versus the coin is, I want to just simplify that for a moment. The blockchain is the train, and the coin is just one thing carried in the chain. There's hundreds of things being developed to carry in those chains. So uh, I have a question, Minister. I'm just not making a statement, but I, I, I assume you gave me a permission to absolutely, make a statement. Go for it, absolutely. So each one of those things are very, very interesting like the medical records. We've been trying to solve that problem. I think Ontario, where my homeland spent on the order of 10 to $12 billion on something called e-health um, 18 years ago, it's not rolled out yet. It's because who has the authority to look at what your stuff is and some secure place to keep it has been a very complex problem. And now blockchain basically solves it um, in, in, in such an elegant way that it lets you put lots of things in there. Smart contracts, you can make a contract like a stock exchange trade where if this trade is going to happen and it has this set of rules that it automatically trades, the chains automatically move around and it's done. And so being the innovators on that, that's really awesome. To be on the lead of this, to be the first country in the world to actually have ICO legislation is phenomenal. I'm going to leave it at that. So, Minister, I actually do have a question. <laughs> I'll you afterwards, don't worry. <laughs> um, the, the thing I'm wondering about on this is, is how much technology do you actually see coming on shore and where, like, you know, electricity is a huge sure, sure. issue in sure. blockchain because you have to, you know, cache all these things. How, how do you see the, the, the kind of jobs people should be looking sure. for as opposed to the technologies question. they should be looking That's for? That's actually a very good question. So, I, oh, I, I, 
I think in the next week I'm going to meet with I'm going to ask for a meeting with the permission of the, with the minister responsible for, tech, um, for um, the regulator to meet with the telecoms companies. We're going to have to look at off, on and off island capacity. I believe the type of jobs that are going to be coming in Bermuda. I believe that um, coding jobs. I believe that jobs with the help desk. I believe jobs with regular internet. The re regular um, uh, 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 regulation, i.e. Um, Compliance, jobs in compliance. I believe that Bermuda, with reference to compliance, because of what we do with regulation, I believe that Bermuda will become the seat of compliance for these companies around the world. Why? It's because we have been doing regulation for a very long time. I believe that companies will set up bespoke opportunities. And so they will have a head shed that has their CTO and has all the technical people. Our responsibility, if I'm perfectly honest, I've seen the scores and I've seen our handicaps and I, and I know our failings. I think that what our key responsibility is, education. Our key responsibility is getting our people ready. When we first started having this conversation, um, uh, Jamie, about six months ago, my focus was how do I get Bermudians jobs? My, sh my, my focus has shifted. Is how do I get Bermudians ready for innovation? How do I get them ready to just embrace change? How do I get them to see that this could actually change everybody's life in the world? And if we started to get people educated about blockchain, educated about this space, I believe there will be a natural shift towards the opportunity because first we're just saying, okay, how can Bermudians make money out of this? And it's almost like you're pimping the technology. And we've seen over years, if Bermudians are in the room and they don't have the opportunity to go up, and they're just piercing an opportunity and they're still living at Black Aton, well, they have no desire to make the country a better place, to row in and, and to see us all succeed. And so something that this government is very particular on, that this technology lends way to, it lends way to everyone in the society benefiting from it. So you don't have to be one of the 40 thieves to start one of these companies. You don't have to rely, look, check this out, no disrespect, you don't have to rely on the bank to get your idea to go forward to raise money for it. What this does, it shifts the power away from traditional sources of financing, from traditional sources of leadership. And I think that our responsibility is to embrace the technology and embrace the learning experience. All right, and this is the final question of the evening, so uh, no pressure, brother. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I guess my question is sort of a statement. I love the, anybody who knows me know I, I love this space, I love the fintech, I love the blockchain, <clears throat> but I don't think we should put a bad light on cryptocurrency, because if you think about it, there will be no blockchain without Bitcoin. That's a fact. Right. So. What I'm trying to say is, I think it should go to education. Let's educate people in cryptocurrency versus, let's not talk about it so much. Because the brother here, I got what he was trying to say. He's got a good point. Let's think of, like you see, the person in the back of the street just say, you know what, I want to invest in stocks for the first sure. time. For people that read like Robert Kiyosaki, sure. you know, they teach you, you know, you want to invest for the first time. A cryptocurrency, one that's properly vetted, you yes. know, it's a company, right? You look at it, like you said, you're really sure of those things of that nature. If the person says, look, I could spend $100, this crypto costs three cents. Two days later, it can go up. They can make some money. That might get people interested. Because reality is, because I've been, as for people that know me, I've been preaching this for a long time. My brothers that don't understand technology just look at this as like, this ain't going to help me. Sure. And I'm trying to tell them it can, sure. but we all know money is the influencer. That's the, sure. That motivates people. Sure. So, so let's not put a bad so look on crypto, I but apolog educate them. I apologize. I apologize 100% if I've done that. So. Thanks. I accept that, and that's actually learning. That's a learning for me, and I thank you for that. Um, I, I want to be very careful with what I'm doing. The national discourse for the country in total has to be around fintech, and I apologize if it seems like I was casting bad, a bad light on crypto, cryptocurrencies. I'm simply saying if the country is to go ahead nationally, we have to have a bigger conversation, and I believe that the bigger conversation is around fintech. I believe that there are people in this room that are never going to get the cryptocurrency part of it, and that's okay. And I believe that the people that are in the cryptocurrency world, they're going to get it, and we have to educate the rest of the mass. But I believe when the minister comes forward, and I have to get everybody in this space to understand why the government is doing things, I have to share the entire vision, and the entire vision centers around the fintech strategy. To be honest, the cryptocurrency piece, and we call it um, digital assets as opposed to cryptocurrencies, um, the digital assets are a key part of it. But that is not where the vision is. So companies are going to come to Bermuda and they're going to set up their digital assets. And I believe, 
I believe that when we regulate it and a portion of the income that they make on an annualized basis comes to the Bermuda government, can I be honest? I believe it's going to eliminate our debt on a quick basis. So that everybody's in this cryptocurrency space and they come to Bermuda, they're not coming to Bermuda because we like them. We're going to have fees that are attached to these services. The fees that are attached to these services, it will go into the consolidated fund to alleviate some of our debt. And so I don't want to cast aspersions of cryptocurrencies. It is my belief that the cryptocurrency business, setting up exchanges in Bermuda, token offerings in Bermuda, we believe that that properly regulated and with the associated fees, well, guess what? That's what's going to get down our debt, and quickly so. You know how much exchanges are making in a day. Some of these companies are becoming unicorns. Unicorns is a billion dollars. These, some of these companies are becoming unicorns in three months. Can you imagine if we take 1% of that revenue as an admin fee? I didn't fall off the turnip truck, right? <laughs> I, I believe, so let, let's, so if I could be honest, I, be, I believe, I believe that this country will benefit from cryptocurrencies. I have to make sure that when I localize this with Mr. and Mrs. Smith in the room, they don't say that Keynes is taking this thing and trying to put the money into a pyramid scheme. I have to set what the vision is and the team through the Bermuda Monetary Authority, tomorrow they will pass the DABA the Digital Asset Business Act, and that will set out how we will manage the, the digital assets. We try to avoid cryptocurrency as a name, and we're calling them digital assets. But your point, I get it, and I will change it next time I speak. I receive that. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to the end of tonight's proceedings. Uh, there are uh, refreshments in the back, if you're minded. Um, and we're going to have the team that's going to hang out for a little while to answer some questions. So if you mind to have some one-on-ones, please feel free. Thank you for joining us at the FinTech Blockchain for Beginners event. See you soon. Have a great night.